For the Life of the World is a production of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. For more information, visit faith.yale.edu. Everybody's um, mad at me for something all the time. And, uh, you know, not to complain about it, like more often than not, they have decent reasons so articulated. But, you know, being someone who sits between two well-defined ideological modes, it's going to be hard to kind of find your place in the order of things. People have felt like I'm either a poor Catholic or a poor socialist, and I'm absolutely certain both of those things are true. But, you know, doing my best (laughs) at all times. And, um, you know, I, I just try to navigate by what I can live with, you know, what I can what I what lets me sleep at night. What do I really believe is good and true? This is For the Life of the World a podcast about seeking and living a life worthy of our humanity. Hi, everyone. I'm Evan Rosa. And I'm Ryan mcnally Lenz, And we are with the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. Thanks for listening to For the Life of the World. Today we have with us Elizabeth Brunig, uh, an opinion writer at the New York Times, formerly with the Washington Post and New Republic, and widely uh, self-identifies as a Catholic socialist. Um, Ryan, I'm so excited that we've got Liz on the show today. What were you most excited about getting her for this conversation? So for me, it's really interesting to talk to somebody who's, uh, you know, not a lot of Catholics are socialists and not a lot of socialists are Catholic. So somebody who's sitting a little uncomfortably in, in a couple of really important communities. Also in this, this moment where, uh, work is such a big deal. Um, you know, we talk about opening the opening the economy back up, and that seems to reduce at some level to let's make sure everybody's back at work. And the big uh, the big political fight right now is over supplemental unemployment benefits and whether to extend them for how long. And people are talking about how well if you give too much, it discourages work. And and I thought it'd be really interesting to hear from somebody who who kind of owns their socialism on uh on how to think about work in a moment like this um what it's what its purpose is and uh and why from a christian standpoint uh we might be suspicious of that emphasis on work as employment in in this moment yeah i think what's fascinating about um about Liz in particular on this topic is, um, is the mode of discourse that she exhibits is one of a kind of generosity and humility, a willingness to listen to arguments to the alternative, um, or to the contrary. Um, but nonetheless, a very strong commitment and willingness to um, speak her mind. And right now we're in a moment where speaking one's mind comes along with a healthy dose of fear. Um, there's uh, a recent poll even that suggests that 62% 62% of Americans believe today's political climate will prevent them from saying things because they're afraid of what other people are thinking about their beliefs. And Liz really does exhibit a kind of a freedom of thought that comes along with a generosity of discourse. And I think that's really on display in the way that she talks about her ideas. It's always interesting to talk to somebody who is uh, so thoroughly engaged in a public discourse that always feels like it's maybe falling apart at the seams uh but is is engaged with a compass and is and is actually trying to do something out there yes absolutely so listener friends thank you for tuning in to this episode featuring the new york times elizabeth brunig where she talks about her perspective on being a commentator for one of the most influential media platforms in the world Uh, her ethical and religious commitments that underlie her commentary, being very online as an opinion writer in the midst of cancellation culture, uh, and the meaning of work, employment, and labor. So thanks for listening and enjoy this conversation. Liz, thanks for taking some time uh, to join us. Uh, You're a commentator and uh, working at the New York Times, previously at the Washington Post. You've had... uh, it seems like a lot of latitude to cover a whole host of issues and to speak about a lot of things. And I'm curious what sort of, what sort of things, what sort of commitments or sensibilities do you, do you want to take with you across all of that? What are, what's kind of driving your commentary? 
Yeah. Well, for first, thank you for having me on. Um, and, you know, in terms of the kind of uh, compass I have going, that's the thing that unites all these different things that I work on. Um, I, I don't really like being a takester. I don't like writing takes that much. I, uh, I have a hard time going short, uh, which the take form requires, uh, you know, a good take in this industry is 750 words, 750 words. Um, and I would usually prefer to go a thousand or more. Um, but the takes, you know, the takes put the food on the table and then the interesting, the fun stuff, the stuff I like to do is, uh, is that long form reported stuff. And the sensibility that unites it all is this sensibility of justice. I like to think an interest in justice and an interest in the human person, the human condition. So I, somebody once said to me on Twitter, you're not a journalist, uh, you know, in one of those typical Twitter spats. And I, I jokingly said, I'm a chronicler of the human condition. Um, this is also my explanation for why I retweet really bizarre stuff that I find. You know, humanity actually is very interesting to me. And as, the, as I thought about it more and more, being a chronicler of the human condition, that's kind of the, uh, the energy I, I try to bring to the reported stuff and to the comic book, this interest in people. Mm. Where, where does the... Where does the, the kind of convergence between interest in people and the commitment to justice come from? Well, you know, from from the faith, right? So I'm Catholic. I'm a Catholic socialist. Uh, you know, this this sense of justice, of the necessity of justice, is predicated on the dignity of the human person, um, and it also comes from you know an understanding of the character of God. Uh, God is very emphatic that He is just uh, and also merciful. Um, so those two qualities are sort of exemplary, I think, in terms of how people should be. And then if you're going to, you know, maximally value uh, a person's inherent dignity, recognize it. That means you're going to be operating by certain rules. There are particular things you can't do. And when you violate those rules, that is injustice. From my perspective, as I think like an older millennial, I think I technically am, uh, you appear to be what I believe they say, very online. And uh, I don't consider that space, that kind of public discourse to be exemplifying justice and mercy in general. Um, like that's not what is usually uh, landing in people's Twitter replies and whatnot. Um, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious, like, uh, so for one thing, like why do that? Why be kind of out there and subjected to that kind of that kind of mode of discourse? And and then secondly, like, does your faith have anything to say about how you try to take your place there? Yeah, I mean, the reason that I'm very online is some combination of like addiction, habit, and needing to do it for work. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, you know, I've I've been in in publishing and in the media, I guess I should say for several years now, you know, the entirety of my adult career. And, uh, they, you know, they want you to tweet, they want you to have a following, they want you to have a built in audience that you can bring to a publication. And this is just part of the new shape of media, right? They're not just hiring super talented writers, uh, or writers with good portfolios. They hire writers who have audiences. Um, so if you're, sort of new on the scene. You haven't been a writer since the 70s, 80s, 90s. You're not a known property. Um, that's, you know, important. And then once you're in the job, they want you to be able to, um, you know, reach out to your audience. They want you to be able to bring in readers who weren't readers before and so on. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's like the best reasons. Um, you know, that's one of the best reasons for being uh, on social media, more or less. And then, you know, the other reasons are like, I also kind of enjoy the weird freak show. Um, and as long as it's 
you know, a, a friend of mine once said that there are two types of stupid in the world. There's happy, stupid and angry, stupid. Um, and I'm totally fine with happy, stupid. Like that's just being silly. And there's quite a bit of that on social media. I think that's pretty funny and partake in it myself to a huge degree is the angry, stupid stuff. That's frustrating. Um, and, and I just don't, I just don't partake in it. I just don't. I mean, the, there's been like a, a debate for the past few weeks raging over cancel culture. Do people get canceled? And if so, is it good or bad? Um, I think it's absolutely a thing. And, you know, you can see it happening. And I think in some cases, it's fine. Uh, you know, Bill Cosby being canceled seems fair. Um, and then in some cases, it really sucks, right? Like, so some people being canceled for uh, political opinions that are wrong, but shouldn't uh, impoverish a person, you know, they shouldn't lose a job or whatever, uh, be unable to find new work because of the wrong politics they have. That's sort of a core tenet of liberalism. And so I'm in the weird position here of being a, a socialist critic of liberalism who is having to defend it. Um, but I, I don't partake in that. I don't dogpile. I don't fight with people on Twitter. Um, I don't uh, tag people's employers, call people's bosses, try to give people a hard time. My view is I'm a New York Times writer. I'm going to have my say. You know, there's a place for me to have my say. And um, I don't need to swing at every pitch on Twitter. Hmm. So do you do you get the sense that people you know are legitimately afraid to to speak their mind and and if so do you think that's well founded uh yes and yes yeah for sure for sure um a lot of writers seem you know quite worried about what they uh can or can't say or how they need to put things um to kind of smuggle them in uh just because it's difficult to predict or i, I think a lot of writers have come to the conclusion that it's difficult to predict what could spark one of these major um, backlashes. And so it seems safer to, you know, refrain from publishing, uh, you know, exotic arguments, I suppose. Um, the exception is if you're crowdfunded, Right. So if you have a sub stack or a Patreon or something, uh, it doesn't matter. So like my husband was canceled in 2016. He lost his job as a National Labor Relations Board attorney and as a policy analyst at Demos, a think tank, uh, because he um, made a, a scumbag Steve meme remark uh, to the head of a prominent D.C. think tank. And for that, he was... Uh, you know, quite broadly accused of being a misogynist and a, a woman hating harasser. You know, this was part of the discourse around Bernie fans in 16. And um, he's totally crowdfunded now. Hmm. That's how that works. Um, if you, if you want to say something that is, uh, you know, distressing or unwelcome to uh, people who, you know, frequently have power, <laughs> Uh, then, then you, then you get crowdfunded and just take the, uh, take the money direct from your readership. Um, so he runs a think tank, a socialist think tank and a podcast. Um, and, and he's a socialist, right? It's not like this stuff is uh, strictly the province of right wingers. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, unless you're crowdfunded, if you're at a big institution that's mm -hmm. already a target, mm -hmm. um, because we're kind of at an anti-institutional moment, um, then uh, people are, are absolutely, uh, concerned. And I, yeah, I don't, I don't blame them. What's, what's work like for you these days in coronavirus time? You're at, you're at home, I assume. Yes, I am at home, um, with my two kids. Um, and, you know, at least one of them is old enough to kind of ignore um, and overcome the, the boundaries that we try to place, such as, you know, like a gate in the den. Um, and so the little one is still trapped in there. We can kind of, you know, treat it like the baby jail. Um, but the older one can easily get out. And it just, um, hmm. I mean, uh, 
it was convenient in that there's certainly um, something quite bad going on attitudinally in the discourse, right? People are super angry and very, very, very touchy, probably for good reasons, right? So like, you know, unemployment is at a record high. Uh, There's a deadly virus circulating uh, in the United States uh, on the rise at this point in many locales. Um, There's this impending unemployment insurance cliff. And, you know, we know people tend to be a little bit edgier in the summer when it's super hot. We're now hitting the kind of dog days of summer, the worst of summer. Uh, and, and people are stuck indoors. They can't go do anything. They can't really go on vacation probably in the ways that they had planned or even just go out and hang out with friends. Um, so people are, you know, pissed and, um, and it shows I'm, I'm taking care of my kids. Everything is extremely slow. Um, which sucks, you know, I, I mean, I like my job and I like my work. And so it's, it's not great to, to see that. But at the same time, I think, well, maybe I, you know, fortuitously stumbled into good timing because now's not a great time to be publishing anyway. You're in the position of having, you know, a pretty, pretty steady job as it goes. Sounds like the flexibility to, to kind of, uh, flex towards childcare some maybe you're writing less than than you want to be i also for what it's worth have have like a pretty good situation going with the the pandemic work world but that's super far i think from from a normal experience uh from what i gather it's gotten me thinking thinking a lot about how there's something work like about everything we do when we're at home and I wonder if if this might be a moment where we can think better about the ways that we tend in our general discourse to to equate work and employment. Like there's a lot of stuff happening that is not uh, is not for pay. Right. Um, Right. There's a lot of uh, work that's not labor market work. You know, it's a. but it's work nonetheless, <laughs> labor. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's, I mean, there's a pretty significant Catholic tradition of thinking about labor, right? Um, and I do think it, mm-hmm. at least sometimes, is is really attentive to that fact of, of labor that goes, that takes place outside of the labor market. Are there ways you're reevaluating work from a theological perspective in this moment? I've always hated work. Um, I mean, I, I like my work in that I enjoy what I do for a living. Um, It's the sort of labor market aspect of it that's really uh, difficult because, you know, that's going to uh, impose certain uh, restrictions on your time and on where you can go in terms of uh, subjects and so forth and what you can do. And so um, and I think that's true for everyone who, who quite likes what they do. You know, they, they still get fed up with the work aspect of it on occasion. Um, and yeah, I mean, my um, dissertation advisor um, at Cambridge, where I did theology, wrote a book called The End of Work. Um, so Marxist critiques of capitalism from a Christian uh, you know, through a Christian lens, basically Christian socialist lens. Um, and so I, I think I've kind of been on board for a while with this sense that, you know, there are ways in which uh, the types of work we do in modernity, especially are, are alienating. Um, and this is, you know, about 20,000 times as true for working class people, uh, that, you know, compared to people who work white collar jobs, richer people. Um, you know, as you said, I have quite a good deal of flexibility in, in my job. That's certainly true. That's something the company really values is uh, flexibility with respect to family and so forth. Um, and m- the majority of Americans have nothing like that. Um, they struggle to pay for or find safe, reliable child care and to, you know, do the jobs they need to take care of their families. And it doesn't really seem like there's a ton of interest in doing something about it. Like, um, I think all of the the energy 
from the social program uh, crowd, the people who would consider themselves something like socialists or democratic socialists, um, you know, that energy tends to be aimed at healthcare, noble, reasonable, I agree with that, or like free college, other things like that. But because this is a young cohort, I think, then, you know, of course, they're not going to be as focused on childcare, etc. I had kids quite young um, for my, you know, sort of generational cohort. Um, I got pregnant with my first daughter when I was 24, um, two years out of college. So I uh, have been exposed to these things, uh, these complications a little earlier. So you're a Catholic socialist. Mm -hmm. You just said, you know, you, you got exposed to kind of parenting earlier than a lot of the other folks in your kind of political cohort. Yeah. How, how are you winding up feeling kind of as a, as, and, and thinking about what are you thinking about as somebody who's sitting in kind of weird intersections between a lot of different communities? Yeah, well, you know, everybody's um, mad at me for something all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, not to complain about it, like more often than not, they have decent reasons so articulated. Um, but, you know, being someone who sits between two well-defined, uh, I guess, ideological modes, uh, you know, it's going to be hard to kind of find your place in the order of things. And so that's certainly been something that I've encountered. People have felt like, um, you know, I'm either a poor Catholic or a poor socialist. And I'm absolutely certain both of those things are true. Um, but, you know, doing my best <laughs> at all times. And, um, you know, I, I just try to navigate by what I can live with you know, what I can, what I, what lets me sleep at night? What do I really believe is good and true? And then I try to, you know, whatever the cost socially or, or, you know, even in just, uh, you know, irritation, I, I try to do that thing. Are there places where you see good expressions of the kind of, kind of stance that you're trying to take, uh, out in culture today? Like where, where do you see kind of where do you get excited? Where do you see any grounds for, for hope from your, from your perspective? Um, no hope springs eternal. <laughs> I, I have, uh, all kinds of hope, but you know, no obvious area where I think, uh, any, anything like my politics is, is, you know, taking root. What do you go back to when you're looking for refreshment in your attachment to that? to that tradition of, of theology and, and politics, where, where do you go for encouragement? Um, you know, I've, I, I don't, I, 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 I think it's right. And when people hit me with arguments against it, I consider them and I just haven't been convinced otherwise yet. You know, there are like books that I, uh, I, I always get emails from people saying, yeah, could you tell me what Christian socialist books to read? And they're, very rare and they're few and far between and they're usually not great. I have like PDFs that I send people on occasion, but really what got me to where I am is just sort of a, a normal study of Christian theology, even, you know, sort of an Orthodox um, study of Christian theology centered on St. Augustine and then a study of the history of private property and especially the Christian uh, approach to private property. And so nowhere in those, in those sort of primary texts that I have read, does someone do an aside and say, you know, this means that uh, a Christian welfare state is licit. You just have to kind of put two and two together yourself, which is what I have done. Um, and so, you know, I, I definitely do spend some time thumbing through, you know, those old kind of foundational things. I will say that uh, Eugene McCarher, uh, is is an amazing at uh, Villanova is a, is an absolutely amazing guy. He just wrote a fantastic book called The Enchantments of Mammon, um, and it's great. And you know, it's certainly the text I'll be recommending going forward when people ask for a Christian socialist text. So that's very exciting and that's very encouraging. You said you don't see a lot of expressions around you. What's the experience like? Uh, kind of looking at a world that is far from the the vision that you've got and maybe doesn't have there's not a lot of immediate prospects um you know it's 
it's not uh, great. It certainly doesn't pack in the uh, the kind of sense of excitement and possibility that seemed reasonable to feel in, say, you know, 2015 when the Bernie thing was really kind of taking off and skyrocketing. You know, I, I <laughs> I'm not terribly thrilled about the prospects for the American left at the moment. You know, the most irritating thing, I think, is um, certain commenters will say like, no, no, no way. Joe Biden is the most progressive Democrat ever to run for president. When he wins, he'll be the most progressive uh, Democrat ever to take office. And like, yes, the I think mainstream Democrats realized after 2016 that it might be sort of useful to integrate some of Bernie's uh, talking points and style into their stump speeches. But I don't see any reason to assume that uh, there was actually much persuasion going on. I don't think that the post-McGovern turn um, to the right in the in the Democratic Party is changed. I think that there is a realization now that to get younger voters, you, you have to uh, make different kinds of remarks. So, you know, um, I don't know. I, I don't expect the world to be good. Right? It's, it's primarily bad, which, you know, comes from a theology of the fall, right? Like, I, I have no expectation that this place is going to be anything but, like, riven by sin. And that's true of, like, me. It's true on the micro level. It's true of the choices I make as an individual. And I don't exempt myself from it. I'm not the only good person, right? I'm, you know. Not that at all. <laughs> and, um, and so I, you know, I, I guess it's just not, uh, yeah, not very surprising, I suppose. Hmm. And I, I have so much other stuff going on in my life that, you know, as far as a good time to tap out of uh, thinking too much about politics goes, being in lockdown with two kids while trying to hold down a, a brand new full-time job. That's, that's plenty. How are you trying to live faithfully in this moment from your, from your perspective? Yeah, was, we, we can't go to mass or see the sacraments and stuff. I mean, that's fine. I understand why that is. Um, so I think, uh, you know, for me, the biggest problem is getting scared off of uh, honest witness because I know there are occasions where people don't want to hear it. And um, what I've been trying to do is, I guess, find a little bit more courage, uh, be a little bit more sympathetic, be a little bit more compassionate. You know, living faithfully is just like morally performing the task in front of you every day at this point. And the, the tasks are usually quite mundane. Um, so, you know, the usual mothering and so forth, working, um, and, and interacting with people on a very limited basis. And I think what I've been focused on is just doing those things in a compassionate, kind, um, kind of understanding way and, and, you know, treating people with honesty and dignity and, and humor and giving people the same kind of leeway that I would want. I think that's, that's about it at this point with the state of things. I'm reminded of this passage in Dorothy Day somewhere where she's talking about how she had this idea of what a devotional life was supposed to be, mm -hmm. which, you know, like intense prayer and lots of time set aside just to be focused on God. And then she, she found herself in this domestic situation where, you know, their kids with needs all the time and all these other people. And the initial response was like, these people are like stymieing my faith, like blocking my devotional life. But then the, you know, the transformation was, you know, the devotional life has to be here. Yes. Here and now. I mean, I'm certainly impressed by and reverent of the sort of contemplative life. I, I can see how that is a good <laughs> deal if you can get it. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, that, that was not my vocation. This is, and this is where I have been put. It's what I've been given. I've been given wonderful things more than I could have ever 
dreamed of, you know, an embarrassment of, of riches in terms of my husband, my kids, the opportunities I have with my job. And so, uh, you know, my, my role, I guess, is just to try to, to do all of those things well in, a, in an exemplary way. And I, I fail at that very often, but I'm trying. Oh, man. Me too. <laughs> Same. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, want to, I want to please God and to show God gratitude every day for the things that I've been given, you know, my children, my, my work, my husband, um, my, you know, my happiness and my peace, you know, these are all, these are all beautiful things that God has given me and I didn't earn them. They don't deserve them, but I'm grateful for them. And not, not to draw us too far back into the politics stuff, but is there a connection between that sense? I didn't earn them. I don't deserve them. And your political social outlook? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I don't take a desert theories of justice uh, seriously at all, because, uh, you know, so uh, when you see sort of conservative arguments against the welfare state, uh, you know, or against raising the minimum wage or, or what have you, it oftentimes comes down to, you know, these people aren't working, or they're not doing useful work, or they made bad choices, in my view. So they don't deserve um, money or, or whatever security. Um, and I, I just don't buy that at all. Everybody deserves the, you know, the capacity to live a dignified life. And, um, in our current situation, that's going to mean, I think, uh, a fair, uh, sort of distribution of goods and the church calls this the universal destination of goods. Um, and I, I think, that's very key to how I see things. It doesn't matter if someone can be proven to have made a bad choice or what everyone makes bad choices. Some of them result in becoming impoverished. Some bad choices result in becoming rich. <laughs> um, and so deserve, you know, where it comes to the necessary things for living a dignified life. Um, you know, I don't think deserve has anything to do with it. I already believe everyone deserves that. So, well, that I think is about the time we've got. So let me just thank you. It's been, it's been a light talking to you. It's been great. Thanks so much. For the Life of the World is a production of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture at Yale Divinity School. This episode featured theologian Ryan McAnally Linz with Elizabeth Brunig of the New York Times. I'm Evan Rosa, and I edited and produced the show. For more information, visit us online at faith.yale.edu. We produce a new episode every Saturday, and you can subscribe through any podcast app. Thanks for listening this week. We've enjoyed reading your recent responses and reviews, and we've been delighted that you found the show meaningful. And we would appreciate your continued support. Three ways to do that today would be sharing the show with a friend by text or email and then talking about it with them, posting on your own social feed or opening Apple podcasts to leave a review and a rating. It's really all for the sake of growing a community of people who believe in seeking a life that is worthy of our humanity. So thank you for your support, for listening, and we'll be back next week.